So as some of you pointed out, uh, I indeed made a mistake when it came to the rules for the um, field renormalization counter terms. So there should be a minus sign over there. So there should be a minus sign here for the field renormalization of the fermions. There should be also one down here for the one of the photon. And uh, then the other question that came up is uh, down here at the bottom line, uh, as was rightfully pointed out, there's a gamma mu proportional uh, to all of these counter terms, but the self energy doesn't have a gamma mu. So how do the two cancel? And to see how this works, the best is to uh, look up over here at this equation. Uh, which uh, was derived from the basic renormalization condition for the field renormalization count term. And you see, you know, that the delta Z term here with a gamma mu and the sigma term without a gamma mu, they basically um, add up to zero. So this is just what I wanted uh, to quickly say about that. Are there any urgent questions about the material from Monday? Okay, that seems not to be the case. Uh, then uh, let's Oops, one second. Let's quickly come to different screens and go to here. Good. Okay. Uh, did this work? Can people see a blank page? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, good. Somehow it doesn't indicate that for me. Good. So <clears throat> today, uh, after we discussed renormalization and QED, I want to move on to how things are in the full standard model. And many of the principles that we discussed on Monday carry over. It's just that we have a more complicated theory. So for instance, when we talk about the field renormalization, there are many different fields we need to consider. For instance, there are the W bosons. They get a field renormalization constant. just as before, uh, so do the gluons. And there are eight gluons, but because the SU3 gauge symmetry is not broken in the standard model, we can use the same field renormalization constant for all eight of these. Uh, Similarly, for the Higgs boson, don't write it all down, gets a field renormalization constant. It becomes a little bit more complicated for the Z boson and the photon because of electroweak symmetry. They are mixed states of the SU2 gauge bosons and the hypercharge gauge boson. And because they are mixed states, one also has to include some mixing in the renormalization. So there's actually a matrix of counter terms. In other words, why this is happening is, um, so we try to, uh, in principle, define a Z and a gate and the photon as uh, the mass eigenstates that we get after diagonalizing the mass matrix in the standard model. Once we renormalize and include loop corrections in the standard model, uh, 
that diagonalization doesn't work out anymore. So we have to take in, into account these corrections and re-diagonalize. And that's basically why these extra counter terms appear. And also the fermion sector is a little bit more complicated than before because in a standard model, the left-handed and the right-handed fermions couple differently. Therefore, they get renormalized differently and they each need to have separate um, field renormalization counter terms. And all of these field renormalization counter terms, they would in principle be fixed by looking at in and outgoing states of physical amplitudes and demanding that these are supposed to cancel the wave function renormalization we get there from the self energies. In addition to all of these, we have a bunch of parameters in the standard model that we also need to renormalize. So there are the gauge couplings. There are three of them. One for hypercharge, I call it G prime. So this is for the E1. Then the weak SU2, I call it coupling G. And the strong coupling, I call it G sub S. So this is for the SU3. In addition, there are Yukawa couplings. They have an index F because they're obviously different for all the different fermions. Um, and in principle, of course, there would be also mixing between the fermions, but for the purpose of this lecture, I'm going to ignore the CKM mixing because it's not very important for electroweak physics. Uh, but in principle, that would be an entire matrix of couplings. And there's one more coupling in the standard model, which is the Higgs self coupling. Which I call Lambda. And because electroweak symmetry is broken, there's one more parameter that appears, which is the VEF of the Higgs field. Call it V. So this is given by the vacuum expectation value of the second component of the Higgs doublet. And it's, there are different conventions, but I used the convention where there's a square root two as well. So numerically, this is around 246 GeV. So these are a bunch of parameters. Uh, they need to be renormalized. They all get counter terms and we need to fix the counter terms somehow. And it is convenient um, as we did before for the example of QED in order to fix these counter terms to use something that we can relate an experimental observation. So the, to relate to observables. So what observables can we use? Well, we can use what we already had for the case of QED. There we used um, the observation of electric charge in the non-relativistic limit or also called the Thomson limit. So this is basically classical electrodynamics, which we can use in order to determine this value. And we can observe masses because they are a peak in the probability of distributions so there are a bunch of masses. There are masses for the massive gauge bosons, W, Z, X. Uh, there are masses for all the fermions. 
So F is an index that just can be electron, muon, tau, top, and so forth. So these are basically observable parameters that we have. Okay, there are a few questions. Um, it asks, in the unbroken phase, is the renormalization method the same? Uh, the answer to that would be uh, not quite. Um, of course, conceptually, it's the same. But we don't have uh, Higgs ref. We don't have masses for the W or Z boson. Uh, and uh, therefore, some of the renormalization conditions that we apply here and some of the relations that we'll use uh, would not be valid anymore. Uh, but you know, we can try to use the same philosophy for coming up for what counter terms we need and how we constrain it. Second question is, some old papers quote a Higgs ref as 174 GeV. Is this just a matter of convention? Yes, it absolutely is. So um, whether you put a square root of two here or not, that's basically the difference. So the square root of two comes from the fact that if you decompose uh, the Higgs doublet into different components, the Goldstone and the physical Higgs field, the physical Higgs field, in order to be properly normalized, has a square root of two B in front of it, one divided by square root of two. And so I adopt a convention where I use the same square root of two, but some other um, um, references don't do that. Mm, is there any possibility that the additional mixing affects the photon's mass? Uh, so the answer to that is no. So one thing that I was just going to mention in a minute is one of the renormalization conditions that we uh, will use for fixing this, this matrix is to say the physical photon, when it's on shell, that means when its p squared is equal to zero, is not supposed to mix with the z boson. That's how we fix one of these um, counter terms. And uh, once we do that, um, we have the same usual massless photon as we have before. Uh, in a more general sense, it's guaranteed to be the case that there will be a massless state because there is this uh, unbroken symmetry uh, uh, that's left after the Higgs gets a VEF, which is the electromagnetic U1. And so we basically just need to fix the renormalization conditions appropriately that uh, the photon gets associated with this unbroken symmetry at all orders. Uh, one more question. So we don't have a Z, right? I don't understand what that is supposed to say. I think the fact that there's a Z boson is pretty well established by now. I, I'm probably misinterpreting what this question means. Um, Okay, gauge dependence, goldstones. Uh, yeah, so um, the goldstones is an interesting question. In principle, since these are not physical states, so you can't really get them as in and out states of a physical process, it's not necessary to renormalize them. However, one could, in principle, just as an extra procedure, renormalize them. Um, the advantage of doing that is that even if you have individual building blocks of a calculation, right, you may have individual vertices, self-energies, boxes, and so forth, um, which just appear as building blocks, you know, with virtual, connecting to virtual states, they would all be individual, you can make them all individual finite by introducing counter terms for the goldstones. Uh, but once you compute a physical process with physical in and out states, uh, they would be, that would be finite uh, whether you renormalize the goldstones or not. So it's basically an optional procedure. Oh, sorry. Okay, now I understood. Uh, so uh, my young's uh, comment was, uh, so this was not really a question. This was about what another student asked about the unbroken phase. Uh, and so he was pointing out in the unbroken phase, you should not talk about photon and Z, but you should talk about B and W3. And that's, that's of course correct. Good, so we have these uh, observable parameters, electric charge and masses, and we have a bunch of 
parameters that appear in our standard model Lagrangian. Uh, so we want to relate those to each other. And at three level, um, it's pretty straightforward uh, how you can do that. Uh, it's useful for this purpose to introduce the so-called weak mixing angle or sometimes also called Weinberg angle. The cosine of which is given by the ratio of the W and Z masses. And I will abbreviate that as C sub W. Um, we also have the sine, which I will abbreviate as S sub W. And now I can write in terms of this mixing angle, I can write the gauge couplings that appear in standard model Lagrangian as the electric coupling divided by sine of the weak mixing angle and G prime would be electric coupling divided by cosine of weak mixing angle. So now I've related G and G prime to things that I can observe, the electric coupling and the W and the Z mass. In a similar fashion, I can express the Higgs VEF through observable things like the W mass and G, which we already fixed before. The Higgs self-coupling, I can also express in terms of the measurable Higgs mass squared divided by two times the VEF squared and the VEF we already expressed in terms of observables. So that way I can express all these uh, things in terms of observable quantities. So this is at three level, but in principle, I could say, well, if it's true at three level, let's just demand that this should hold at all orders. And this will then give us conditions for how we can find counter terms for G, G prime, V, lambda, and so forth. And doing that, this is called the on-shell renormalization scheme. So this scheme, we enforce these three level relations. To all orders in perturbation theory. Um, okay. Um, so there's one more follow up question about the goldstones. So do you mean we need to do field strength renormalization of the goldstones? Uh, so the answer to that is you don't need to uh, because field, field renormalization you only need to do for physical states that go in and out of your process because uh, these, is, these receive the wave function renormalization which uh, change basically the amplitude that you compute, the probability for this scattering to happen. And the field renormalization is supposed to compensate that. Uh, if these are internal states that only appear internally, and that's true for the goldstones, right? They can only appear internally. You cannot observe them. Uh, then you don't need to do a field strength renormalization. You may do it if you feel inclined to do so, uh, but whether you do it or not will not change your final answer for a physical process. And somebody asked about lepton mixing angle. Okay, you're getting a little bit sticky here maybe, but uh, I can be more precise. We ignore CKM and PM and S. All right, it would be the same story of course for both of them. Good. You may see that in this list of relations that I wrote down here, there's still one quantity that is missing, which is the strong coupling constant. And there's a reason for that because unfortunately, there is no reasonable on-shell definition that we can use. The reason being we cannot go to the non-relativistic limit as we did for the electric coupling, 
course, in the non-relativistic limit, there are no gluons, quarks anymore. We have hadrons. It's a whole different uh, situation. Uh, really, the strong coupling only makes sense to talk about for high energy processes. And uh, so there we don't have a good on-shell uh, notion anymore because, you know, at high energies, uh, these are not on-shell processes. Of course, quarks are very light for the most part. Um, so this is the only coupling for which you have to use something else than on-shell renumerization. And it's customary to use what is called the MS bar scheme. And in the MS bar scheme, we use a purely technical prescription for getting a counter term. Uh, this is done assuming we use dimensional regularization. We kind of have to do that. We cannot use a different regularization scheme. And then this counter term is defined, first of all, with some generic constants that always appear when we do loop integrals. So a four pi and a e to the minus a Euler gamma. Uh, and that is taken to the power of the number of loops L and epsilon. So L is the number of loops that we are computing for which we need to counter term and epsilon is the mismatch of right around the mismatch of dimensions four minus d divided by two d being the number of dimensions we use in dimensional regularization and then the essential part is that uh, of course this counter term needs to cancel any divergencies that appear in the loop integrals. And so there will be some coefficient divided by the highest power of divergent terms we can get. If we have L loops, that's epsilon to the L. Uh, and in principle, if we are talking about something, you know, it's two, three loops, there can be a, a one divided by epsilon say cubed for three loop pole, but there can be also lower poles. They need to be canceled as well. And these coefficients, they get chosen such that any kind of um, physically relevant uh, amplitude becomes finite. So for instance, we could look at a coupling of quarks to a gluon. This shaded blob again includes a number of possible loop diagrams to whatever order we are computing. And to this, we add a counter term, delta GS, times the three level coupling. And now we need to fix the C sub L, C sub L minus one and so forth that appear in a counter term such that the sum of these two becomes finite. So this is how we find what the correct counter term is. Good, so we have a few more questions. Um, the, um, so the first one is, I guess, a question about the onshell relations. Can we always enforce these conditions at all orders, even with some new physics? Uh, the answer to that is yes, we can. Um, if the new physics just appears inside the loop, so as virtual particles, it's entirely as in a standard model, nothing changes. It's just you need to take these in into account when you compute the loops. Uh, if the new physics also appears as uh, external states that you think you'll observe in an experiment because they are maybe light, then of course you need to expand your theory. Uh, you need to also include uh, couplings, masses, and so forth for these DSM states. Um, but the renormalization conditions for the standard model states can nevertheless stay the same. Uh, one more question for the full standard model theory. 
we mix the on-shell and MS bar schemes. Can we use two or even more renormalization schemes for the same theory at the same time? Can we mix more than one scheme in the calculation of one process? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question, but the answer to that is yes, you can. As long as you're clear about what you use for what, right? So what I cannot do, I cannot say that um, for part of my calculation, I renormalize the weak coupling G to the on-shell scheme. And for another part of my calculation, I use the MS bar scheme for the very same coupling G. And that would be inconsistent, obviously. But as long as I say I always use on-shell scheme for G, and I always use on-shell scheme for the completely separate coupling G sub S, that's perfectly fine. One can do that. Uh, and one more question. In the unbroken phase, do you do the same to the W and B field as we are doing to the gluons? Uh, yes, basically the answer would be exactly the same. Uh, also the W zero would have the same field renormalization as the W plus or minus or W one, two, however you want to call them, um, uh, because the SU two symmetry would be unbroken. All right. So now that we have this set up uh, and we have written down what the on-shell um, scheme is supposed to do, we can go ahead and derive explicit expressions for the on-shell counter terms in a very similar fashion as we have done for QED, right? We had there this expression for the mass counter term in terms of the self energy. We had an expression for the field renormalizations in terms of the self energies. And we had an expression for the charge coupling renormalization, which actually we could relate to field renormalizations because of the ward identity. So all of these in principle would carry over with some modifications Uh, for instance, we need to take into account uh, that for the fermion self energies, there's a difference between left and right handed. We need to take into account that there's photon Z mixing. Uh, so those things basically need to include it and they create some extra complications. I'm not going to write them down here, uh, the modifications that appear for the interest of time. But in the lecture notes, I, I have given some examples that come from photon Z mixing also how one would fix the photon Z mixing counter terms by just demanding that the physical on-shell states, so the, the photon and the Z boson that we actually observe as propagating states that they do not mix. But here I want to address another point, um, another modification that occurs that uh, I find actually kind of interesting. Um, which has to do with the mass renormalization. For heavy particles, because they are heavy, they are unstable. So I'm thinking of things like, in particular, the WZ boson or the top quark. Uh, it would be also true for something like the Higgs boson, but its lifetime is pretty large. So uh, yeah, it's not so important. So uh, the key, key new thing that appears when they are unstable is that the self energy develops an imaginary part. And before we have said the onshore condition is we look at um, the pole of the propagator. So when the momentum is such that the propagator develops a pole, then the particle is on shell and the momentum squared is equal to the mass squared. Right? That's the condition that we had. But now if 
the self-energy as an imaginary part, it means that this pole of the propagator becomes complex. So how do we make sense of that? Well, to discuss this, let me pick an example, specific example. Let's uh, focus on a W boson. So if I write down again the um, renormalization condition for the mass, it says that the pole of the propagator that the propagator is supposed to have a pole, sorry. So that means the denominator of the propagator is supposed to be zero. Well, and in the denominator of the propagator, there are these two terms. There's this three level term with the field renormalization and there's the self energy. So this is supposed to be zero. And from what I just said already, we know that in order to be zero, the uh, value of k squared has to be something that's complex. So it has a real part, which I write as m squared as before, and it has an imaginary part. And this imaginary part is associated with the decay width of this particle. So that's why the gamma w appears. So to evaluate then what this renormalization condition gives us, I will first of all assume that numerically gamma is much smaller than m. This is generally true if we have a weakly coupled theory, like the standard model at high energies. And if that's the case, then I can make some expansions. On the left-hand side, I mean, this term with a Z in this equation, I don't need to make an expansion. So let's just plug in what we have. K squared is W squared minus I M gamma. Oops. And then there's the bare mass squared and I write the bare mass squared as the renormalized mass squared minus the mass counter term. And for the self energy, I plug in this complex K squared, and then I expand for small gamma. So the leading term has only the real part. Oops, it's not supposed to be K of W. Then I get a linear term in gamma and the derivative of the self energy. And there would be higher order terms, but for now I will forget about that. So this equation ought to hold when uh, k squared is at the proper value of the pole uh, and it has real and imaginary parts. So both the real and imaginary parts need to value, so uh, need to vanish. So let's look at them one by one. First, the imaginary part on the left hand, uh, on the first term of the equation, I have uh, ZW, MW, gamma W. And for the second term of the equation, I can get an imaginary part for the self energy. Or I have this term here with the derivative of the self energy has an I in front of it already. So if I overall want the imaginary part of that term, 
I need the real part of this derivative of the self energy. And now this is an equation I can use for actually getting a prescription for how to compute gamma, the decay width of this particle becomes imaginary part of self energy divided by mass times Z and plus the derivative. And this may look like something you may have seen already somewhere in a textbook or so. Um, what will look a little bit different than what you may be used to is if we look at a real part. So on the left hand side of the equation, you see there are two MWs, which cancel. And then what we have left is Z times mass counter term. And from the terms with the self energy, we get the real part self energy that again looks like what we would expect for a mass counter term. But then there's an extra term. which involves the imaginary part of the derivative. The self energy. And uh, so that term uh, is oftentimes not discussed in textbooks, but it actually should be there in principle. Uh, so we derive that by going to this procedure of realizing that the pole of the propagator is complex. And so this is how this term appears. Uh, but one can also actually uh, check through various identities that if we did not include this term, which is circled here in blue, then the mass that we would get out of uh, the renormalization condition only with this term, this real part of the self energy, would not be gauge invariant. So it's actually kind of ill-defined and this other term should be there. The reason why it often doesn't get mentioned in textbooks is because in principle, if you compute the decay with gamma, you see it's proportional to the self energy. That's already kind of a quantity that's of the order of one loop. And we have another self energy. So in principle, this only appears at a two loop order, right? which is oftentimes not discussed in textbooks. So this is for the mass. Um, another obvious question that can come up in, in this context is, well, if we have to deal with this complex pole for the mass, then what about uh, the field renormalization, the ZW for, uh, for this unstable gauge boson? Uh, and that indeed becomes a bit of a problem, right? So this field renormalization, as I mentioned before, what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to uh, compensate for the wave function renormalization, right? So the self energy correction that appears in the line of an ingoing or outgoing state. Now the question is, what exactly would be a proper in or outgoing state? Should it have P squared equals MW squared. So everything nice and real. Or since the pole of the propagator is complex, should we say it should be MW squared minus I M gamma? Should it be the complex momentum? And really there's no good way to answer that, this question. Uh, and we don't need to answer it as a matter of fact, because what we need to recognize is really truly the W boson cannot be an asymptotic in or out state of a process because it's unstable. 
Whenever it's produced, it will decay, and therefore it only occurs as an internal particle. And for internal particles, we actually don't need to include a field of annualization. One can check that explicitly if one wishes that if I were to introduce a field renormalization for uh, an internal particle, it would actually drop out of my calculation. For example, let's look at this diagram here. This could be, for instance, say for top quark decay, right? Top going to bottom. Here's a W and this is whatever, say lepton and neutrino. So at each of these vertices, I would need to include a field renormalization for the W boson. But then for the W boson propagator, I also need to introduce a field renormalization. So each of these axes is supposed to indicate places where counter terms are inserted. And uh, one can you know, pretty easily check then that the renormalization of the vertices and of the propagator uh, cancels and the contribution of CW in them cancels. Good, let's go back to some questions. Um, okay, uh, about the gauge. Can we use more than one gauge in one theory? Like we use a Feynman gauge for QCD and QED, the massless bosons, while we use unitary gauge for W and Z. Yes, you can. So uh, as long as you talk about different fields, you can fix the gauge of different fields in different ways. That's definitely possible. Um, even if you are ambitious, you can even uh, introduce an arbitrary gauge fixing parameter for each of them uh, and include that arbitrary gauge parameter in your calculation and check that in the end your answer doesn't depend on it. Um, the derivative is with respect to k squared. Yes, it is. So this is, I guess, uh, the question about this derivative over here. Why is it not drawing? Oh, sorry. Now I know why. It's about this derivative here, right? So this is with respect to k squared, indeed. Um, else do we have? Ah, what does the lower index T stand for? I just forgot. Uh, I, I can sympathize with that. It happens to be two. That stands for transverse. It's the transverse component of the gauge boson. The longitudinal one is we don't need to pay attention to because it disappears because of what identities. Um, the white right Wigner from propagators also from the one-loop correction. So will we double count? Uh, I'm not quite sure if I understand that question, but let me defer that to later because I will actually talk about bright weakness in uh, some number of minutes. Next question, don't people compute W to W, WW to WW scattering? Should we not include a field renormalization there? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so, if you are computing corrections at one loop order, you can get away with doing a field renormalization for the W. The reason being, as I mentioned before, this term with gamma times self energy that I have for the, for the mass renormalization here is formally a two loop term. Uh, the same if you were to derive whatever you want to do uh, for the complex or for the real part of the pole, if you were to derive any condition for the field renormalization of the W, the difference between those two definitions would be of two loop order. So if you do a one loop calculation, you can come up with something that makes sense and you can do the computation. But if you really wanted to compute WW to WW at two loop order, um, you would have to actually at that point start thinking about, you know, okay, uh, how are they produced? How will they decay? You cannot necessarily look at that in isolation.
don't we need ZW while calculating the gamma renormalization? Uh, that's, uh, that's another good question. I guess that's a question about uh, this CW that's down here, which would in principle appear there. Uh, and yeah, that would be there. But um, this is what happens here is actually kind of similar to what, what I indicated on the next slide, where, uh, you know, the field renormalization appears in different places then in the end cancels out. So the same is also true for when you actually call this gamma here. This is not explicit in this formula. And now I don't want to necessarily spend time on showing that, but it will also drop out. So we don't actually need it. Uh, another question. We know that the photon mixes with the Z, and if we use different gauges for them, does that bring any problem? Um, not really. Uh, field renormalization constants by themselves are actually gauge dependent. All the, you know, many of the different building blocks that we have are gauge dependent when we do calculations. Uh, but any physical amplitude will not be gauge dependent. And so, um, yes, if for instance I use different gauges for the photon and the Z, this will affect those field renormalizations and the mixing renormalization counter terms. But that's not a problem. We just need to carry it along. Another question, what differentiates the instability of WZT from say a muon? Is the conversation different in that context? Conceptually not. It's the entirely same story also for a muon, uh, but practically there's a difference because the muon is very long lived. So its width is, uh, I don't know how many orders of magnitude smaller than the mass, but it's completely tiny. And therefore, um, it's a very good approximation to say that the pole of the muon propagator is real rather than imaginary. In other words, the imaginary part of the muon self-energy is teeny, teeny, tiny. So you can also just assume that that one is zero. Good. Um, so, Now, I wanted to kind of in passing uh, address another thing that is kind of interesting about renormalization that's oftentimes not addressed in textbooks. And this is how to renormalize so-called tadpoles. So this is not about uh, biology and development stages of frogs, but tadpoles refers to a certain types of diagrams, for instance, if I again look at the contribution to this decay that I just had a little earlier, and I compute a one loop correction, I can have a one loop correction of this sort here, where the dashed line is a Higgs boson. And then inside that loop can be anything that couples to the Higgs boson, like a top, W, C, and so forth. It doesn't matter. So there are many such diagrams that appear, tadpole diagrams that appear in a practical calculation. Uh, and they are kind of annoying to compute. They are by themselves easy to compute, but it's just, you know, it uh, increases the multiplicity of diagrams tremendously if you take them into account. Uh, and oftentimes in practice, they are not being computed because we don't really need to. You can use some trick that we can absorb these. by renormalizing the Higgs wave. Now, I mentioned earlier, we can relate the Higgs wave to uh, the couplings and the masses in the standard model, but we don't really need to use that relation because the Higgs wave by itself is not observable. So in principle, we can renormalize it in whichever way we want to. So I can basically write down a relation between a tree level WEF and a renormalized WEF plus some counter term, which I call delta V. And I can fix this delta V however I want to. It will not affect any physical observable. 
So the V0 at three level can be computed and it's self coupling divided by the mass term of the Higgs boson squared and the square root of that. So just to define exactly how these parameters are normalized, let me write down the potential. So the mass term appears in front of the quadratic term of the Higgs field, the lambda term in front of the quartic like this. Yeah, and then if you minimize the potential, you get this relation here. Now, phi itself has several components, as you know. Let me write it as follows. There's the charge goldstone. And in the neutral component, we have VEF, X field, and neutral goldstone. So I will plug that into the expression for the VEF. And then I will also use the fact that this mu zero squared is related to the X mass. Again, this is all at three levels. So this is only for the bare couplings. But once I include higher order corrections, the bare mass can be related to the renormalized mass plus a mass counter term. So I can introduce this mass counter term here for the Higgs mass, and I can introduce this vacuum expectation value counter term over here. If I do all that and I plug this into the potential V0, then I can write this potential V0 as a sum of two parts. The V is a renormalized potential which has just the same form as the bare potential, but written in terms of renormalized quantities. And just to, vo to avoid any confusion here, I use mass and VEF rather than mu and lambda for these renormalized quantities. And the delta V contern contains all the counter terms. There's a constant piece to these counter terms, which doesn't involve any of the fields, just the VEF and so forth. Uh, which is a little bit lengthy, so I'm not going to write it out. Then there's a term which has just one Higgs field in it. There's a mass term, which has the mass counter term. As expected, plus an extra term. And then X squared. And then there's also a mass term for the gold stones. And then there would be also interaction terms with three and four fields, which again, I'm not going to write down. So uh, here I have introduced the symbol delta T uh, which, um, oh, I didn't write it down in my notes. That's funny, but it's, it's proportional to the Delta V. Uh, let me see if I can quickly figure out what that is. so successful, I, whatever, it's, um, I will check that. It's, I need to write things out. But it's, it's basically this delta V times some other basic constants uh, in our theory. 
So in this result, we can see a couple of things. Uh, so this in front of the H squared, that's the mass counter term for the Higgs boson. Uh, I have before on purpose put this twiddle here because what I can do, I can uh, just absorb this extra VEF renormalization into this mass counter term, I can basically just say the sum of the two are my actual mass counter term for the Higgs boson. So it's the sum of the two that I need to fix with the on-shell renormalization condition. Then this term over here is really the interesting part. So this is a term with just one Higgs field uh, that doesn't exist in the standard model a priori. So it makes a new Feynman rule. Uh, which I can symbolically write as one X line ending in, in, in nothing, basically. And so this potential would say whenever I write this, this gives a minus I delta T. And so that is good because this I can use for getting rid of my tadpoles. I can now choose the value for delta T, meaning the value for the VEF renormalization, such that the sum of these tadpole diagrams plus this counter term adds up to zero. And so when I do that, I don't have to compute any of those tadpole diagrams. So that's very convenient. There is um, a little bit, one can say, of a price I have to pay, or at least uh, some funny consequence, namely that the goldstones, which a priori are massless particles, because of this renormalization that I do here, they get something like a mass. And even though this is not a mass I can observe anywhere, I need to include this mass contributions in my calculation. Uh, okay, uh, let me check the questions again. Um, for fixed order calculations, physical quantities should still carry some gauge dependence, right? They are not manifestly gauge independent. No, they are. At each order in perturbation theory, any gauge dependence has to drop out. Uh, they, um, there cannot be a cancellation between different orders of perturbation theory. You can kind of see that because they are parametric, parametrically, parametrically, sorry, different. You know, they have different powers of the coupling constant. Uh, and so there can be not a cancellation between them. So, uh, and this, you know, can be something that, of, of course, for you know, some particular choices of gauges can be checked explicitly that they are gauge independent. Uh, it can also be checked more formally by checking the validity of um, word identities. Another question, what will lead to H1, which leads to the breaking of C2 symmetry? Uh, is this a question about uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking or something like that? I'm not quite sure if I understand the question. If you could maybe clarify it. Would you please remind me what Delta T stands for? Yeah, sorry. So I, I failed to write down the except exact relation between delta T and delta V. Uh, I believe there is, uh, I have to check this and, and I will um, fix the notes accordingly. I think there's some NH squared or something. They are proportional to each other at least. You know? So this, and this comes directly from plugging this relation for V zero into the bare potential and then just expanding it out and you get various terms that are proportional to delta V um, plus some other constants. It's always the same constants that appear, so it's convenient to 
uh, they parameterize that as a new thing that we call delta t. I should have noted it down. Um, why don't why don't terms with just one field h also show up in the standard model? Wouldn't phi squared give us a term proportional to v h as well? Uh, if you keep v as just some symbol that doesn't mean anything, then indeed this would be true. You know, you plug in this uh, this expression for phi into your potential, and you get terms that are linear in h. But of course, v is supposed to correspond to uh, the value of the field where the potential is being minimized. And once you fix v that way, the linear terms disappear. Another question, do we have tadpoles associated with the Z? Uh, excellent question. And the answer to that is no, we do not. That would be prohibited by gauge invariance. So uh, such a tadpole, if you perform a gauge transformation, it would transform under that gauge transformation. And um, if it was non-zero, then this would imply that uh, the uh, the, you know, different gauges are not equivalent. In practice, you can just go ahead and compute such a diagram for a Z boson. You always find it zero. Uh, you can kind of see fairly easily also that it's zero because um, it has an index mu, right? So if you compute it, something it has to be proportional to that index mu. But what can be proportional to it? The momentum could be proportional to it. But the momentum that flows into this loop must be zero because of momentum conservation, because nothing flows out of it. So if the momentum is zero, you don't have any other Lorentz quantity left that can give you something with one index. So for gauge bosons, the tadpoles are always zero. You can only get them for scalars. Another question is which terms do cancel the mass counter terms for the Goldstone bosons? Um, well, if you do uh, an entire calculation, you get all kinds of crap. You get, for instance, self energies for Goldstones. Um, they do not necessarily one to one cancel against this mass counter term, but obviously there are various divergencies floating around in, in mass, in, sorry the self energies for gold stones in the vertices for gold stones and so on and in the end there's some cancellation of divergencies so it does work out but you know it's uh, it's not necessarily obvious to see for each individual term if we choose delta t to cancel the tadpoles we also fix delta v that's correct uh, and then does the three level relation v equals mu squared divided by lambda still hold no, in that case, it would not hold. So you're basically taking advantage of the fact that it doesn't need to hold because V is uh, an unobservable parameter and we modify it. What other terms exist in delta V? Are they only terms that are renormalizable? Uh, yes, they are only terms that are renormalizable, right? So we start out with four powers of the field over here. And then, you know, if all the parameters get counter terms and so on and so forth, still the highest power of fields that we can get is four. So they would remain renormalizable. All right. Um, good. I meant to talk a little bit about other renormalization schemes. Uh, I did mention the MS bar scheme in passing already. Um, but uh, because I'm kind of short on time, uh, I maybe don't do mention it now. Um, and instead, I want to move on to something entirely new. Ooh, what is that here? Page. To a new chapter, now moving on to electric precision observables.
oftentimes abbreviated as EWPOs. So in principle, electric precision observable is anything that can be measured with high precision in an experiment, and it has something to do with the electric theory. It's however customary to separate them into two groups. One group, which I may call inputs. These are even more precisely measured quantities. Uh, but what's even more important is that they are unlikely to be affected by new physics. And then there's another group which I may call the genuine electric precision observables. And these are the ones you will oftentimes see listed in some presentations about them. And they are quantities that actually can probe new physics. And this is where we want to get with this whole discussion in the end. So let me begin by talking a little bit about input parameters. There are a couple of them. So in principle, there's no fixed prescription which one I have to use as input parameter. But a typical choice that many people use is to use the fine structure constant alpha, which is the electromagnetic coupling divided by four pi. Then the Fermi constant for muon decay, which are called G mu. The strong coupling alpha S. Now that's not necessarily so precisely measured, but because it's kind of on its own, we have to use it as an input. The mass of the Z boson, the mass of the Higgs boson, the mass of the top quark. Of course, there would be many other fermions besides the top quark, but for the most part, we can neglect their masses because uh, their masses are so much smaller than the weak scale that typically any corrections you get from that are negligible. The one exception is if where these masses appear in logarithms. If you remember, this is something we discussed on Monday. This appears in the charge renormalization. We do get logarithms of the masses. There we have to do something else, like take data using the dispersion relation. But if they don't appear in logarithms, then basically uh, the masses of any particle besides the top quark is negligible for most purposes. Sometimes we may need to include the bottom quark mass, but that's about it. So let me begin with the first of these parameters, alpha, the fine structure constant. There are two main ways how this could be measured. One is from the electron magnetic moment, which is very precisely measured using penning traps. Uh, the magnetic moment uh, in the Dirac theory would be two. Once one includes radiative corrections, it is not two. And the difference to two is parameterized by this alpha, the anomalous magnetic moment. The first correction to that was computed many decades ago, and it was basically a confirmation that quantum field theory works. It's alpha divided by two pi. Uh, and sometimes later, two loop corrections were com computed. Three loop corrections were computed. Four loop corrections were computed. And, hard to believe, but even five loop corrections were computed in QED. So this is a true a tour de force to actually achieve that. Uh, so these are corrections that come from photons and electrons themselves. There would in principle be also electroweak corrections, 
but they are suppressed by the ratio of the electron mass divided by some heavy mass scale, say the W mass squared or so, which is a very small number. So uh, just including one loop corrections for that is perfectly sufficient. So if one takes the measurement for A sub E and one includes, includes all these radiative corrections, the result for alpha or rather the inverse of it is 137.035 or with an uncertainty of three, five in the last two digits. So this is 12 significant digits, impressive result. One would think that cannot be matched by anything, but it actually can. There's also a measurement from atom interferometry, interferometry. So what is being done here? Uh, one sends a laser beam onto uh, atoms and measures the kinematic recoil from the laser photons. The laser energy, uh, laser frequency is very well known. One measures the kinetic energy of the recoil. Uh, one can basically learn something about the mass of the atom. So this kinetic energy measurement is achieved through interferometry that allows such a very precise measurement. So we get the mass of the atom, and then we can use spectroscopic knowledge in order to relate this mass to um, the coupling. Because if I compute uh, spectroscopic levels in the atoms, uh, the answer to that depends both on alpha and on the mass. So if I know the mass, I can get alpha. And the answer, one gets for that is, well, also a lot of digits, a lot of the same digits. It's about equally precise with two seven in the last two digits. Uh, another extremely precise measurement. Uh, you observe if you compare these two results they don't agree perfectly. There's about 2.5 standard deviation tension between these two values, which gets some people very excited. Um, remains to be seen if this is just a statistical fluctuation or not. Okay, um, there are a few more questions. Uh, I guess they still relate to the previous slide. Does this not change the fermion mass counterterms since fermion masses come from V? Uh, so that's a good question. But again, V itself is not observable. It's not a given, fixed given thing. You know, I wrote down before V is 246 GeV, but this I only get if I impose a certain relation. Um, let me see which slide I have that relation here yeah here so if i impose this uh this relation here v is 2 mw divided by g if i say this should not hold at three level but at higher orders then i can compute the value for v but um this is a relation that i was imposing i can impose a different relation for v and uh, then its value numerical value would actually change what does not change is the value for the observables. So the W mass, G, the fermion masses, they would all still have the same value. V changes its value. The relation between the masses and V also change if I change how I renormalize V. But physical quantities remain the same. Is the intuition of why these uh, input parameters are insensitive to new physics? Great, yes. Um, so there's no uh, strict proof that they are insensitive. Uh, the um, assumption that they are insensitive depends on assumptions we make about new physics. So here for alpha, for instance, if uh, any new physics is supposed to affect it, it has to be new physics that's very light. 
every new physics does the same as the weak corrections that were, I was writing over here, you get a suppression with the mass of the particle involved. And uh, we have various reasons to believe that new physics may be a heavy particle. Uh, and then, you know, that it would have a very small impact on the magnetic moment. The same is true also for the atom spectroscopy, right? Any contribution of heavy particles is suppressed by its mass. Um, now, if you imagine there could be very light new physics, then this mass suppression is not there anymore. Uh, but there are independent reasons to believe that such very light new physics has to be very weakly coupled to electrons. Uh, and the reason has to do with that is, you know, uh, we have studied interactions between atoms or at larger scales between actually macroscopic bodies very well. Uh, so any kind of uh, very light long range interaction between them is very much constrained. So that there are really not very many examples that you could come up with that would mess up these measurements. I don't want to say it's impossible if you're creative enough and you make a sufficiently baroque new physics models, maybe you can do it. And one more question. Why are there no corrections to the electron magnetic moment due to strong interactions? Uh, so there are some corrections. So in principle, mm, I, oops, this slide, I could write a term here with, um, whatever, let's call it A prime one one, which is proportion to alpha alpha S. So the corresponding diagram to that would look like this. So you have an electron line coupled to a photon. This photon measures the magnetic moment. And then I draw a correction. Uh, sorry, I have to put an alpha squared, which has photons here, photons here, quarks in the loop, and then there's a gluon. So, so these are quarks. So these corrections do exist, uh, and uh, they are actually somewhat similarly to uh, what we encountered already for the charge renormalization. They are difficult to compute because the uh, characteristic scale of this process is the electron mass, which is very small. So in that case, Q, uh, QCD is not perturbative, but we deal with hadrons. Uh, but fortunately, the effect of that is not very large. This is a similar argument as we had for the uh, uh, electroweak corrections. So the coefficient has to be proportional to the electron mass squared divided by whatever is the relevant hadronic scale in the loop, which would be at least the pion mass squared. And the pion is actually already pretty heavy compared to the electron, right? It's a factor of 300, something like that, squared. Uh, and then um, <coughs> you have two powers of alpha on top of it. The alpha S, of course, is not meaningful anymore once we talk about uh, non-perturbative QCD, but you get the two powers of alpha. So this is a pretty small correction. Um, and if you just are able to estimate it to, you know, a few percent level, that would be more than you need for this purpose. What is G mu in the input parameter? Right, so this is the decay constant uh, of the muon and the Fermi model. I could uh, talk about this a bit more, although in principle our time is up. I don't know, what do the organizers say? Um, uh, I mean, this would take maybe two, three minutes, something like that. I could write it out. Yeah, go ahead, take a couple of minutes. You started a little bit late. Okay, good. So, yeah, this was the next input parameter I wanted to talk about. So this is something in terms of measurement we get from muon decay. And historically, muon decay can be described by the Fermi model, which in modern language is an effective field theory, where we have a four fermion coupling, muon going in, and its decay products going out. So electron, muon neutrino, electron antineutrino. And this square block here 
Uh, that's the coupling and it has a coupling strength, which I call G mu. So it's also called the Fermi constant. And for measuring muon decay very precisely, one can get a value for it, which is 1.166378. Seven with uncertainty of six in the last digit times 10 to the minus five GeV minus two. Because it's an effective coupling, it has uh, actually dimensions. So also you can see that this is pretty precisely measured with something like uh, seven significant digits, six to seven. Uh, and that's why it works well as an input parameter. Again, also the relevant scale is pretty low. It's the muon mass, which again uh, makes it not tremendously strongly affected by new physics. For extracting this value though, there's some theory that needs to go in because there can be QED corrections. They exist even in the Fermi theory where the Fermi theory doesn't know about weak interactions. It just puts this effective coupling there, but it does know about photons. They have been computed, including one such photon loop or even two photons. So at next to next to leading order in QED. So these need to be taken into account in order to get this value of GMU. Good. So let me maybe finish here for today. Um, and I believe now is our coffee break, is that right? No, now is lunch. Now is lunch. Oh, now is lunch and the coffee break is later. Good, so coffee um, break is I, I will try, coffee I will try break to is connect to one of, oh, sorry, <laughs> the time Go ahead. is messing us up. I will try to connect to one of the coffee break rooms then later and you know, you can ask me some more questions there. Yeah. and. And I think Michael might also plan to connect to the other to one of the other coffee rooms as well. So I hope people will show up and ask lots of questions. Uh, and I think usually uh, Tom and myself and Ethan are also there. Mm -hmm. So there should be enough uh, old people for you to bug. And if you don't want to talk to any old people, you can you know talk amongst yourselves, which is probably more fun anyway. All right. So we thank Iris and. Uh, We'll see everybody back for the coffee break and then for the lecture at 2 Tasi time. Yep. All right.